And our final speaker of the afternoon is, I'm sure, uh, known to many of you, Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker, who has been a great mentor and friend to me and to the program in Ecology, Spirituality, and Religion here at CIS. She's the co-director and founder of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale, together with her husband, John Grimm. They organized 10 conferences on the world's religious traditions and ecology at Harvard in the late 90s. And for me, that was my introduction to this field. I picked up one of those volumes called Buddhism and Ecology, and I said, wow, people are doing this work. This is amazing. Um, and those conferences became 10 volumes, Buddhism and Ecology, Hinduism and Ecology, Jainism and Ecology, Christianity and Ecology, so on, and really ignited this debate about what the world's religious traditions um, had to say about ecology and environmental issues. And there's um, indigenous traditions in ecology, of course, as well. And more recently, they wrote Ecology and Religion that Island Press published a couple of years ago. They worked closely with Thomas Berry and edited his book. And then more recently, Mary Evelyn and Brian Swim produced the film and book, The Journey of the Universe. Um, I imagine many of you are familiar with it. It, it won an Emmy Award. Um, and is available on Amazon Prime. We just watched it here at CIS a couple weeks ago and had a great discussion. Um, and there's an online course on Journey of the Universe um, available via Yale and Coursera. And so let's welcome Mary Evelyn Tucker. <laughs> though for a minute. That was pretty intense what we just listened to. Let's, let's just stand, breathe, do a rub on somebody's back or whatever. And while you're doing that, I am going to give a huge thank you to Elizabeth and Kim Carfor and Elizabeth McAnally. Uh, they have done such a great job. So while you're stretching, let's clap for them. support them for next year Woo! as well, Woo! right? I've got to keep going on yes. this. Um, so that was so beautiful, and I want to thank all the panelists uh, for sure. Uh, and I just want to say that indigenous conference that we did at Harvard in 97 was, at that time, one of the largest gatherings of indigenous peoples from every continent. And it was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And that work is going on and on and on, as you can see. And Standing Rock being the largest, maybe the most historic gathering of native peoples on the North American continent, not only in modern history, but in history. I think we should also clap or give up all of our energies for the ongoingness of Standing Rock. So my husband, John Grimm's specialty is as a student of indigenous traditions, and we are very blessedly adopted into a Crow family on the high plains of North Dakota. And they have been our teachers as well for many, many years, as well as the Salish people in British Columbia area and uh, the Northwest Coast. I want to also just say though, that this, the project that Elizabeth highlighted began for me as well with a tremendous sense that the civil rights movement really was inspired, inflamed, when the religious communities in their plural form joined and said, no more segregation, no more. And I was a 60s person, went to college where Nancy Pelosi did, mm -hmm. Kathleen Sebelius. We were profoundly engaged in civil rights. And so I want to give a big shout out to Carl Anthony and his presence here for all he has done uh, along those lines of ecology. <laughs> for his book, <laughs> The Earth, the City, and the Hidden Narrative of Race. 
and he and Paloma have done so much great work on this area. So thank you. You know, I, I would begin just by also citing all of these panels have been so inspiring. You know, the work that people are doing against great odds is what keeps us all going. And that's why this is so important to create community, to hear the stories, to hear what the scientists have said for a long, long time and their own difficulty in getting at the message of climate change. So it was terrific to start with Susie Moser. Um, so I've got some pieces of this that are written. This is a, kind of a long paper that I'm, I'm just going to offer some comments from. But, but I want to begin sort of this larger picture that the promises of modernity have been endless. Economic comfort, leisure time, participatory government, and individual freedoms. But these problems appear uh, attainable, unattainable for many, as the inequities of so many societies, including, of course, our own US society, but not alone, as these inequities become more and more evident. Moreover, one thing we haven't touched on sufficiently, but the militarism we have spawned in leading to a destructive arms race around the world, even larger than the Cold War, the day after the climate march in New York, September 21st, New York Times top article was, we are going to be refurbishing nuclear weapons at $3 trillion. Just factor that in. And that is why the Earth Charter is so important, because it has ecology, justice, and peace. And that's the movement that we have to put together, ecology, justice, and peace. So there's a looming sense, clearly, of uncertainty about the future, even before 45. Um, we are in need of enduring visions of reality that are healing and sustaining for the human spirit and for the spirit of the earth as well. This is where religious and spiritual perspectives have a role to play, along with perspectives from new materialism, the aesthetic perspectives, philosophical perspectives, nature writers, many of these. The, up, the upheaval that we are experiencing has an uneasy feel to it because there are so few viable ways forward that seem to have authenticity and depth and a coherent movement, a coherent movement. Our political and economic institutions are failing us, clearly. We need not elaborate that here. Our economic institutions, with their siloed approach to knowledge, seem inadequate to the task of genuine transformations. There's much talk about the need for interdisciplinary courses, but the specialized training and reward systems of academia don't lend themselves to this approach. This is why bringing together Religion and ecology has been such a challenge, such a challenge. Beginning 25 years ago at the American Academy of Religion, a society of 10,000 teachers across the world, really, and beginning at Harvard 20 years ago, it was brutal. It was brutal. Namely, secular academia wants nothing to do with religion. Did you notice that? <laughs> so I would go out in this park and hug a tree, literally, before every one of those conferences. Unbelievable sense of the dissing of what we've heard here, the dissing of all of the religions as having anything to say about the science, technology, economics. That's what's going to solve these problems. No. <laughs> and that's why the work that's being done here, both in academia and beyond, is so crucial. So even 10 years ago, when we came to Yale, hyper-secular Yale, it took 10 years to create a master's at the Divinity School in religion and ecology that was just voted in January. Just voted in January. <laughs> So we are so grateful for all of you here, what you're contributing against oppos opposition, skepticism, indifference, despair, as we heard. Um, and we look forward to creating new paths with you um, forward. The immense creativity of NGOs, of grassroots movements, again, that we've heard here all day long, 
And incidentally, on our website, we have engaged projects um, that we are happy to put your engaged projects up there as well. So beyond the, these various challenges and, and our differences, the call of the earth itself is this sense of a shared future for future generations. And there's no future without a shared future and even a common future. That is the call of the earth. That is the dream of the earth that Thomas Berry was um, putting before us. And that will require the efforts of all of us, scholars and activists, spiritual seekers and cultural reformers, religions, religious people and non-religious alike. We've got to get over these separations. We absolutely do. Because we will not be divided and conquered. We will not. So the solidarities are absolutely critical. If you don't like Christianity, there are many forms of Christianity that are doing extraordinary things. And we've got to acknowledge that the Pope is one huge example of that. That encyclical alone has shot this movement into a huge reality. I'll come back to that. <clears throat> um, I've already mentioned the inspiring examples of Standing Rock, Flint, Michigan, we can speak to as well. But the efforts, as we've heard, to protect water, land, forests, fish, animals, humans, and non-human animals will be ongoing in this century and beyond. Indeed, some have paid with their life for this struggle, such as we have just commemorated Berta Caceres in Honduras a year ago. So engaged scholarship and teaching is aligned with transformative and sacrificial change for a flourishing planet. So what I want to do is highlight, we've got to link um, to these key areas, this is one point I'll make, namely science, education, economics, and policy. We can't only talk to ourselves. So scientists are opening up to this perspective. Why? Because the climate science hasn't communicated. Um, and they realize culture matters, values matter, moral principles matter, people's belief systems matter. This is a huge and unprecedented opening. Why do we have SUSE here? Why do we have other um, scientists at ANPAR who were in despair when the science of climate wasn't communicated? We've got to go through that opening and uh, collaborate. The, um, the encyclical that I just referred to, the Ecological Society of America, 10,000 ecologists, two summers ago in August in Baltimore, endorsed their president, their past president, and future president, endorsed the papal encyclical on interval ecology. Unprecedented. It had a rippling effect through all the science organizations. I sat next to the president at lunch um, at that meeting, and she said not one scientist had any objections to this. Isn't that extraordinary? These are the things that we can move forward with and think of the opposition of the Pope, by the way, when we think of our own oppositions, multiple, myriad, and never-ending. Um, certainly in education, in 20 years, we have had an explosion of courses on food, seeds, agriculture, extraordinary interest in this area that we didn't have before, on animals, animal consciousness, animal uh, rights, and so on. The, the sense, of course, we're in a living, sentient world, duh. But in 20 years, that has exploded um, in, our, our, uh, in the writings and so on. In environmental humanities, I want to come back to that. It's a special topic. Economics, we've also had ecological economics of Richard Norgard, but Gus Speth, our former dean, is doing a whole program called The Next System. Look it up online. He's got lots of articles from people all over. This, this sense at the heart of this beast of modernity is a failed and flawed economic system. And we know that, as we were hearing at lunch, even in Davos, they know that it's a failed and flawed economic system. Um, and, and finally, in terms of policy, 
there are all kinds of sustainability studies exploding in universities across the country, and they are taking eco-justice as very much part of these uh, programs. They're not leaving it out. Our school, over 100 years old at Yale Forestry and Environmental Studies, was all environment, as Susie said, you know, just science. Um, now, social science and humanities, religion and ecology, you cannot ignore it. Um, but that is work that's still to be done, I can assure you. Um, okay, now I'm going to make a couple of points sort of that are retrospective about this field and prospective. In other words, where do we need to go? Okay, so I've spoken in the past of this field in academia, and some of you are, you know, want to just get rid of academia in a way, and I understand it, but it's why we are fighting this struggle in the heart of the Yales and the Harvards and so on. You see, it's, it is a struggle every single day. And without John Grimm, I could not do this. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you, John. Seriously. <laughs> um, uh, this, this is just an anecdote. Two scientists who are wonderful people, after we finished Journey of the Universe film, and they actually loved the film, they said to us at lunch, why did you make that film? And I said, well, partly, and here's how tentative it was, partly to think about, to consider, maybe, probably, there's a sense of sentience in this pro process. Not, not organic, inorganic, sentience, livingness in this whole process, and perhaps to say there's meaning, there is even purpose. Oh my God, they went crazy. <laughs> they went crazy. There's no purpose except in humans. There's no meaning except what we give to it. Okay? Cultures around the world, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, completely different perspectives from that, right? This is laden with meaning, with pattern, with intelligences beyond what we can imagine. The intelligences of salmon to migrate back to their birthplace, of turtles, of caribou, migration alone, bird migrations, we haven't got the slightest idea, almost. Magnetic fields, yes, and so on. The layered, rich, luscious intelligences of this world is what this conference was bringing forward, um, and it's one of the ways forward that are absolutely essential. So, okay, what I'm suggesting here, deepening of the field, but also supporting the force as it comes out. Okay, the force, grassroots, NGOs, and so on. So if we talk about deepening of the field, and I'm giving you these only to suggest that this, this is an energy force, namely there's some good news here, <laughs> despite um, the other news we have to listen to, but <laughs> graduate programs have actually emerged. Um, at Yale, I mentioned the new master's program, University of Florida, but here at California Institute of Integral Studies, this terrific program, um, Sewanee University has a master's program. The Greening of Seminaries is working on this, GTU, um, and many other se uh, seminaries. There's many courses now in religion and ecology that just were not there in both secondary schools and colleges. Secondary schools are very interested in this. Publications. This year alone, two handbooks on religion and ecology that's also including water, food, air, soil. This, this kind of dialogue uh, partnering. There's a, a flyer back there. Um, but the diverse voices that we've spoken about, many of you are, are in that volume, so trying to include the diverse human voices, the diverse non-human voices, that is one of the huge leaps forward for this field and this force. And finally, for the, for the field, <laughs> un imaginable for us 20 years ago. There were seven positions in religion and ecology, including Santa Clara, uh, Santa Barbara, between their um, ecology department, religious studies, Dartmouth, St. Olaf, Carleton, University of North Texas. Universities are getting this. They want to hire young people. That's very exciting. 
unbelievable when humanities hires are very, very low, I can assure you. Um, so, religious leaders have emerged. It's not only the Dalai Lama and the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, the 17th Karmapa, who has hundreds of thousands of followers in China. Um, he's a Tibetan Buddhist, hundreds of thousands of followers, and he's speaking about, he's 29 years old. He came in here last year, his book at Stanford, at, at Yale, at Princeton, and so on and so forth. The following was immense, and his, one of his deepest messages is the spiritual transformation. Interdependence, Buddhism, thank you. Um, we have other you know, terrific leaders, Captain Hayhoe is in the evangelical community, Rowan Williams um, was head of the Anglican Church, Captain Jeffrey Shorey who was head of the Episcopal Church here, she's a scientist but also a spokesperson. And you know, I just want to keep singing out the leaders at Standing Rock, beginning with the young people, starting the fire, making this a spiritual movement, making it a nonviolent movement, the leaders were from all ages and from many different countries who came to align. When Cornell West went out there and said, you have had to deal with genocide first, then we dealt with slavery. That's the alliance, you see, of leaders and groups that are emerging at this time of immense suffering and destruction. A movement, as has been said, um, is emerging, and that is extraordinary, and we can't let it be divided. We cannot let it be divided. So we can speak about the religious organizations, these grassroots interfaith power and light, Earth Ministry um, up in Seattle is doing amazing things. You know, 20 years ago, there were no documents or statements from the world's religions. It's incredible. Okay, 20 years is like a blip. So this is what we're saying. We're ready for the further energy of everybody in this room and beyond. You know, we can also breathe out beyond this North American continent where, especially here, our news is so circumscribed. And I want to just highlight two examples on the international scene. Iran. We've been to Iran three times. At the invitation of the Iranian government, 2001 in the spring, 2005 in May, 2016 in April. The Islamic Republic of Iran, based on this notion that Islam has a sense of trusteeship for the future of the planet, is absolutely committed to this. They're living in a desert. Mm -hmm. President Hatami said in both 2001-2005, the most important thing for us is the environment, not terrorism. The river in Isfahan, their beautiful ancient city, had dried up when we visited there. This is critical in the Middle East. This lot, these uh, conferences were supported by United Nations Environment Program, the, the ones in the 2000s. They were reaching out to the international community under a program that the UN supported called Dialogue of Civilizations. Dialogue of Civilizations. Persia is one of the great crossroads of civilization, right? Everyone in the government, including the Vice President and Minister for the Environment, Ebtikar, a woman, okay? These are highly educated people. Everyone speaks English. Many of them have had degrees from here, okay? UNDP, Development Program, also supported these programs. We have a visa from Iran on our passports, and we are worried about going abroad and coming back wow. because the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of Norway, was held up at Dulles because he had a visa from Iran. <laughs> Held up. Unbelievable. Okay, the other extraordinary international example to consider is China. Now, we began these conferences with our concern for China and India, countries now both well over a billion people. China and India will change the face of the planet. They already are. Tar sands, oil are going to China. Our resources are going to China, by and large, many of them. The transformation that those of us in Asian studies anticipate of the suffering that we are now seeing, 450 million people 
just recently with this huge cloud over northern China, right? Half of the country couldn't breathe, trying to get out of the country. These are so serious. Every time I go to China, I get sick. But people who are living there, children, there was one program called Under the Dome that was uh, shown just a couple years ago by scientists in China. 30 million people watched it within two weeks, and then it was shut down. But the, they allowed that knowledge of the air pollution, the water pollution. And you go to India, which I've been doing since 1974. It is beyond the beyond, truly beyond the beyond. Delhi, which passed winter, um, et cetera. The Yamuna River, where we did a conference, Elizabeth and the family was there. It is, you can't drink it, you can't go into it. That wasn't the case for the Ganges, the Yamuna, these sacred rivers when I first went to India in 1974. This has happened just like that. And the question is, how can we reverse this, stop it, um, put some kind of halt to it. Okay, so one of the crucial things that we need to do for this movement um, is integrating ecology and justice, which has been the central theme. And I'll just return for a moment to say we have been doing a series at Orbis Books on ecology and justice. And those of you who may want to write or contribute to that uh, series, we'd be delighted. We're doing a series, uh, a workshop. Cynthia is participating in it at the American Academy of Religion this fall. Clearly, we cannot have people working on just the environment or people working on just social justice. It is essential that we integrate it. And that's why I think, once again, the encyclical I was so thrilled. I came back from China, and reading it on the plane, I got up to visit my sister. I couldn't stop this feeling that this is one of the most important documents of our lifetime. Because the Pope is a rock star himself. <laughs> Why? Because he's so authentic, right? His little fiat. He's <laughs> not, no, no red shoes, folks, kind of thing giving to the poor, et cetera, et cetera. But mostly because he took the elements of liberation theology from Latin America, and he put them together, people and planet. That's integral ecology. And he says it in a language that is so accessible. He says, this isn't just about Catholics, even though there's a billion of them, not just about Christians, even though there's two billions of them. There's everyone on the planet, and every religious tradition has responded to this encyclical. It's up on the forum uh, website. So, hope with the Pope is one of my, <laughs> uh, one of my feeling. Okay, so the final two points that I want to make is complementing science and social science as solutions to our environmental problems are what's emerging. Again, against great odds, against suspicion of scientists, is what's called environmental humanities, okay? Which includes history, literature, art, music, philosophy, and folks, religion. <laughs> I, I, if, you, if you can believe this, I've been to various campuses and it's everything except religion. You see, these secular campuses. So that's what we're trying to do. It's the ninja move, <laughs> see? Very gently insert religions the largest NGOs on the planet, which is what UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, considers them. So we're trying to take that umbrella. Here's religion and ecology, 20 years old. 85% of the world's people pay attention to it. Maybe we should too. Um, OK, so that is a movement forward. And finally, um, what I think is perhaps one of the most hopeful uh, complementary movements um, is this sense that's come up here over and over again of vital matter, what we would call in East Asia chi, which is matter energy. What are, what are you cultivating in Tai Chi, Qi Gong, as Elizabeth understands well? What are you cultivating in all of these arts? A chi 
that goes through everything, matter energy in differentiated forms. So this understanding that the West is finally getting over this split, okay, all the dualisms, we can name them, but this is why this particular movement, which we're trying to align with, uh, with people who are writing vital matter, like Jane Bennett, people who are writing how forests think, Eduardo Cohn, people who are writing do glaciers listen, the interconnection of fungi and, and mushrooms and so on and so forth. So the intelligences of the world about us that is alive, that is sentient, that is all our relations and so on, as that comes pouring back into our consciousness, I think we will have an unstoppable energy for this movement. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.